Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Gabrielle Ruda. I am the owner and director of Philosophy Arts. We are a contemporary art gallery based in New York City. We are also a progressive education space dedicated to promoting philosophical engagement with contemporary works of art. Um, we have recently started a webinar series called Disclosures Through Dialogue based on a column we have in White Hot Magazine. We are very proud to be featuring the mixed media artist Dinga McCannon for our third installment this evening. There is um, a lot to say about Dinga's life, um, hard to encompass in a half an hour. I'm gonna read a short bio because I wanna cover some of the, the highlights here. So Dinga McCannon is a revolutionary painter, sculptor, and mixed media artist whose work was central to cultivating the second Harlem Renaissance in the 1960s and 70s. Her early work influenced a generation of artists to adapt alternative media into their paintings and champion the use of crafts such as quilting and fine art. A founding member of the Way You See Artists Collective and Where We At, Black Women Artists Inc., she was a pioneering voice for marginalized people seeking recognition in the art world. McCannon's work uses brightly colored acrylics combined with found items like antique jewelry and expert textile work to depict the people, places, and movements of which she has been, an a, part, which she has been a part. An important chronicler of Black life in America, McCannon is, uh, has just become represented by uh, Friedman Gallery of New York. Her work is now featured in um, a private sale at Phillips and a major acquisition by the Brooklyn Museum is soon to be announced. Very exciting stuff we're gonna cover this evening. Um, so the another aspect of what is involved in this series, Disclosures Through Dialogue, is partnerships with other uh, galleries or curators. Um, and the reason why we are uh, able to talk about Dinga tonight and have become so uh, involved and engrossed in her work is through our relationship with Korish Mabubi and Fine Art. Um, Korish recently featured Dinga's work in uh, his last show, Forget What You Know. And so Korish, I'd like to throw it to you first um, to tell us a little bit about um, how you came to learn about Dinga McCannon's work. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Um, welcome everybody. I'm very excited to be part of this discussion, uh, particularly uh, as we're featuring Dinga, Dinga's work uh, that, that I absolutely love. Uh, I am Korosh Mabubian. I am an art dealer, uh, art collector, and, and a consultant and a curator. And um, I first started working with African-American artists in my gallery, Cyrus Gallery, back in 1988, um, when I represented Howardina Pindell, Tyrone Mitchell, Marin Hassinger, and, and I was not exclusively an African-American artist, so there were a number of other artists, but I was, uh, our gallery was one of the few that actually did represent uh, black artists in, in, in the mainstream art scene. Um, those artists faced certain struggles and barriers that they had to break down in that generation. And, and if we move forward 30 years to 2020, we see that the black art movement is, is alive and thriving today and young artists are, are doing very well. Um, they have access, they, they are not rejected in the same manner that they were uh, 30 years ago. And they, they have stood on the shoulders of their predecessors to achieve this. But we still go back to those artists from the 70s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And um, so here what we have is Tyrone Mitchell uh, with uh, his friend Dinga or Dinga with her friend Tyrone. And it was through Tyrone my artist from Cyrus Gallery that I got to meet Dinga. Uh, I asked Tyrone for an artist for this show that he was participating in. I said, I, I need someone who can construct uh, works of art with mixed media and uh, I'd love to have something with textiles. And by the way, if, I, if you have someone who's a woman, that would be even better because I try to represent you know, evenly across the board. And Tyrone said, what, you didn't consider Dinga? You, you've got to go look at Dinga's work. I was surprised that all these years I didn't know Dinga. Uh, Denga brings to the table not only amazing skills and her, uh, her incredible character. First thing that Denga said to me when I asked her about the D in her name was she knew she'd be famous someday. And she put the D in there so no one could forge her signature. Denga took all of those skills that were taught to her to become a woman, um, sewing and, and stitching and whatever else may have been there and included them with her art training 
to become a mixed media artist. And it took her 55 years to become an overnight success. But I, I think rather than tell you about that, I'm going to let Denga herself speak. Uh, Denga, please tell us about your work. Uh, welcome to this panel discussion. Uh, it was a thrill to have you in my show. And, and why don't we go ahead and talk about what you're doing um, in your work with, uh, with your early inspirations first. Okay, um, my early inspirations, well, first of all, I'm a mixed media artist, as you've said, uh, and I was inspired by a lot of things. Mostly I'm self-taught. Uh, I found Katie Colwitz probably when I was 16 or 17, and I was very influenced by her work because to me it said art can do things, it can say things, it can tell stories. And she was probably one of the first artists who I saw who used her artwork to make a comment on what's going on in society. I've been influenced or not necessarily influenced, but affected by other artists uh, like Jacob Lawrence and Charles Austin, because I was a student of theirs and more so than uh, being inspired by their style, I was inspired by the fact that they actually existed because those two were two well-known African-American artists and I didn't know a lot at that time. Um, going forward now, oh, I can actually see sort of a resemblance between Charles's dancers and my dancers. That's what we were thinking. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. And I didn't recognize that before, but I see it now. And sometimes I think there's an unconscious thread that sort of uh, is sewn between artists um, who have similar ideas, similar histories and whatnot. And it comes out in the work, whether we realize it or not. Did the, was your color palette affected by um, Charles in particular uh, or um, or through Jacob Lawrence, there's a boldness to the color that might have been a change during this time period? No, I think I've always been attracted to outrageously loud, bright colors because that's part of African heritage. When you go to Africa, six o'clock in the morning, women come out dressed in glitter and gold and orange and purple. Same thing on 125th Street. You see people in lime green pants suits, uh, red outfits, uh, my history and heritage, this involves a lot of color. And at the time with my earliest part of my career, I was told I used too much color, but I never pay attention to what other people say. I just kept doing what I felt that I should be doing. Nice. And so you found solace and you know inspiration in these in studying with these teachers also because there was a, an ability to move away from the European canon and the tradition that was otherwise um, so much at the forefront of art education. Yes, most definitely because um, the European thing is. Fine, but it's not the only way that artists in a universal sense work. People work different ways. And I couldn't relate to the European system of working because um, I felt more drawn to what I'm doing. And I didn't want um, to be influenced by all of that. And actually I wasn't, um, I respect you know, the traditional arts and all of that. But I also uh, respect arts from the, the, sport, the African diaspora, which when you look at two images, they're completely different, but they're both art. Absolutely. Um, so as part of our um, series, we like to um, look at an artist's work uh, through a philosophical lens and our resident philosopher who's with us tonight, Donovan Irvin, um, will uh, share with us the philosophical concept that um, he's uh, come up with for this evening. So Donovan, can you tell us about heritage and how it's relevant in Dinga's work and what you have in mind here? Yeah, absolutely, Gabrielle. Thank you uh, so much and thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure to talk to Dinga about uh, this. 
we mentioned before the period in which she was learning and establishing herself was as an artist is considered the second Harlem Renaissance. And the philosophy behind the original Harlem Renaissance was laid in 1925 by this anthology called The New Negro uh, that was compiled by Elaine Locke. And the problem facing black artists at the time was one, the what was considered acceptable fine art was this European heritage. And their own heritage was said to be less than. It was, you know, under white supremacy and these sorts of ideas, the aesthetic was you can't figure, you can't paint African American figures, you can't paint images of black life or the problem that Dinga encountered with her color palette not being accepted. It, it wasn't what was thought to be appropriate for fine art. The project of the New Negro was to rehabilitate and to put forward the heritage of the African diaspora as something worthy on its own and to draw upon the African heritage as something equal to and on the same level as the classics from Greek or Rome or, or anything like that. So that became an important philosophical motivator for the Harlem Renaissance. And then especially as we get into the 60s and 70s, that second wave of the Harlem Renaissance where you had a strong push to find value in Black identity with the Black is Beautiful movement. There was also this desire, and I would love to hear Dinga talk a little bit about this, to create the space outside of the traditional um, museum system and educational system for this kind of art to flourish. So um, Dinga was involved in a couple of really important artist collectives and educational programs in Harlem at the time. That actually, I'd love to hear you talk. If, could you just say a little bit about that, Dinga? Um, these organizations that you were part of helping to form during that time in the early 70s in, in Harlem? Okay, the first organization um, that I came into view with was the Way You See Artist Collective. I met them probably uh, the day after my 17th birthday. Um, they were at the forefront of the Black Arts Movement. And uh, I met them through an art show that uh, they had on in the projects, on the fence of all places. Because uh, one of the philosophies is that art is for everybody. And so the art was basically taken to the people. Uh, the next group, I spent a lot of many years with and helped found was where we at Black Women Artists, which addressed uh, the issues that we as Black women artists were having. Uh, also, we too, like what you see, we wanted Black art uh, to be presented to Black people. We didn't um, really research or seek, seek out uh, museum museums and the major galleries because we were kind of concerned about giving or having a tradition within our own community for our art. And with both groups over the years, what we did, we built our own audiences. We had shows in uh, small galleries. A lot of shows were held in people's homes who had turned uh, a room or two into a gallery because the person loved art. And from then we went to schools, colleges, and occasionally a museum. But the premise of both groups was to create or recreate a culture and then to disseminate that culture, not only through Harlem, but through the entire United States. Uh, Dinga, wasn't there, there was a, a someone in the Wayusi Collective who was very insistent that you would get a printing press, is that? Yeah, that was uh, Abdullah Aziz. He was working, this is the late 60s. He was working, uh, I can't remember the printmaker, but um, he was doing silk screen. And he came back and told Wayusi that we had to have a press because with the press, we could produce our own images and they also could be sold uh, at a reasonable price, which is another uh, issue dealing with art people have to be able to afford it. So we got that press. Um, we all studied printmaking with him. And then later on, we all basically went to the Robert Blackburn printmaking workshop, which was in Chelsea, which had a wood, uh, wood press, lithography press. He had 
several presses up there and had been opened, I just found this out, since 1947. He's one of the first black men to have his own printing studio. I love that part of the story because it speaks to this question of accessibility and the democratizing of the art scene to allow people to see and appreciate this art and build your audience. Mm -hmm. Because it, it wasn't just a fight to include black figures, although I believe you were told at one point in your earlier education to not why questioned why your figures were black, but also to include different media in your work that there was a, a some resistance to include some of those crafts work and and what was thought of at the time as women's work with textiles and sewing. So trying to get that into fine art was also a, a sort of struggle. Um, so I, I like a, this is a very very powerful and impactful time in contemporary art history. I think that you've been a part of. Thank you. And finally, all the forms are beginning to merge, or at least to have equal value. Sure. Dinka, could you tell us a little bit about these two photos? Okay, this is me. Ooh, I must have been, oh, maybe 20 at the time. Um, the photo on my left, I'm painting a mural. We had a, um, I had a job that some at the Studio Museum which used to be located on Fifth Avenue. And it was myself and six other men artists. And we basically set up our studios in the museum. And then we decided to take the work out to the streets. And so we did uh, two murals and this is one of them. This particular one was located right across the street from where the Harlem State Office Building is now on 125th and Adam Clayton Power Jr. Boulevard. Over here is a piece that I probably created a couple of years after that, which is now owned by the Brooklyn Museum and is called um, The Revolutionary Sister. And here you see where I'm beginning to use a lot of collage, nails, uh, found items, and yeah, and even the old bullet belt, which was a fashion statement at that time. And I morphed it into my revolutionary woman, revolutionary sister, because every revolutionary needs some kind of artillery. So there, that's how I put in her artillery by putting the bullet belt in. And then the coat that I'm wearing there was a tribute to where we at. Um, we had, we wanted a revolution, black radical women, 1965 to 1985. Um, and I was very honored to represent where we at. However, it was a little sad to me that a lot of us had not made it to that point. And so I made a coat and I put every woman that I could find that had been in our group on that coat. If she's not on the front, she's on the back. So that was my way of bringing us all to the table. That's wonderful, Dinga. Um... And this next image, I think, going back to uh, well, so Jenga, there a number of the of the works, uh, the figures don't have faces. Um, is there uh, a motivation behind that? Um, they don't have faces because I would like the viewer to say that could be me, mm. and so sometimes I leave the faces blank. Um, I, I'd like to make a comment on that that. The first time I heard you answer that question, Dinga, before you answered it, I had my own variation of what I thought it was because as, as we see through these works, Dinga often paints um, heroines, you know, the, these powerful women who, who have done heroic things in their careers and in their lives, um, but who often didn't get recognition. Um, so Bessie Smith was a, you know, an incredible jazz singer, but like so many others, Black women had a harder time being famous. Mm -hmm. And so I always looked at these faceless figures as, as representing them as being in, invisible. Mm -hmm. That we see everything else but the person. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And their stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this work is stunning. And it is available for sale through Koresh Mabubi and Fine Art. <laughs> um, so. <Indeed>. Uh, <laughs> And, and this also was in Korish's show. This has now been placed in a, in a new home um, with a very loving collector. Um, but so here also celebrating uh, a female musician. We do have a face here though, 
Um, is there a difference in your motivation, Dinga, between the way you honor Bessie Smith through this kind of portrait um, that where it could be every woman uh, versus this work where, you know, there's, it's much more detailed? No, I think it was more uh, artistic uh, sense. It just seemed right to put her face in there. Also copyright issues. You have to, can't just use anybody's image. Also, another thing about Mary Lou Williams is that she was known as a jazz pianist, but throughout the quilt, she's known for, she wasn't as well known for a lot of other things. She was a multifaceted musician and most people don't know that. But through this piece, this will help them know that she was. Beautiful. One of the um, things I like about those works is that they sort of monumentalize. And like a lot of quilts, which we'll talk about here, in a, uh, they have this narrative quality to them to mm -hmm. chronicle and tell a story about a history, not just to preserve it, but to raise awareness of it and to give people something to take pride in and to uh, you know share in. Mm -hmm. I think those are really important aspects of your work. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to go back in time a little bit and look at um, some other textile works and show the development perhaps to um, get to your place in art history and uh, see what has come before from different traditions. Uh, so Korsh, do you maybe want to tell us a little bit about these? Uh, absolutely. So what we have here are, are two tapestries. One is a quilt, one is a, uh, a woven rug. Um, the one on the left um, is a, a quilt made by um, Lucy Pet Petway uh, from the G's Bend uh, Quilting, I guess, Quilting Collective. But, but it, it's a traditional African-American quilt, um, very stylized in a particular manner of, of making quilts. The item on the right is a... Uh, 17th or 18th century Gobelin tapestry. Gobelin was founded by Louis XIV as the national uh, weaving company for France. And, and uh, the Gobelin did all of the uh, tapestries for Versailles and all the royal palaces and so on. And it, it was considered a very high art form. Um, it represents what we consider the Western canon. And you know, here we have uh, a, an image um, taken from, from uh, uh, Ovid's Metamorphosis, and, and you see a story and, and people and uh, in, in a forest setting uh, woven into the tapestry. And we in the Western art world are told this is what we consider art. Move to the left, we have quilting, which has been traditionally an African American art form. Doesn't look like the item on the right, and yet there is no less of a creative element or an art form in it. Uh, to me as a modern art collector and as a contemporary art collector, I look at the item on the left and I identify with everything that I see in, in the artworks that I value as, as modern art. This tradition is one from which I see Dinga's quilts having come. I mean, part of, part of that tradition, part of that background. If, if we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll see a continuation. I think that they're also both at the Met now to just well, show these are, both, I, these are both artworks at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Neither of these are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art now, um, although we'd like the Dinga one to be. That would be great. Um, that would be great. Uh, the item on the left is actually, it was from my family collection. It's a 17th century uh, Persian textile. Uh, and the one on the right is one of Dinga's quilts, a tribute to Maya Angelou which is currently in the Phillips sale. So um, if you like what you see, go take a look at Phillips. What we see is Dinga's using elements that are available to her, uh, whatever she can find, whatever, whether it's embroidery or, or collage or uh, things that shouldn't be uh, applied like uh, beads and bottle caps and metal parts and anything else constructed into a two-part quilt that nonetheless has, it, it still retains some of that familiar shape and pattern to the G's bent quilt we just saw a few minutes, a, a minute ago. And if you compare it to the item on the left, uh, which, why did I pick Persian? Not just because it's my heritage, but because it's outside of the Western canon. This is not considered Western art. And you look at this and it's silk and it's embroidery and it's uh, weaving. And there is a pattern that very much resembles 
the kind of innate human pattern of life that appears in, in the quilting and in Dinga's work. I imagine that if this had not been an important artwork, Dinga might have taken pieces of it and included it in her own pieces uh, to enrich them. So comparing them side by side shows us this crossover that we all share. Mm -hmm. What I love about this and looking at the, the last slide in comparison now to looking at Dinga's Maya Angelou tribute is that you can see the compartmentalizing of color and shapes and you see that sort of underpinning of, of what the Jisven quilt looks like, but also the narrative being told, you know, whether you know who Maya Angelou is or not or her story, you can tell that there's great strength in the, in the woman being depicted and reverence for her, um, which I think also is carried through the, the double image. Um, as well. Dinga, what, what was your motive? You've, you've made a few works of art uh, in tribute to Maya Angelou. Was, was there a particular moment that made you turn to, um, you know, uh, first rendering something based on her likeness or how'd that come about? Yes, that came about because um, there was an exhibition uh, call put out and they wanted works that uh, reflected Maya Angelou. The exhibition was, um, I forget the title, but anyhow, there was maybe like 40 artists and we contributed works. I started on the part on the right-hand side. Then I said, well, um, and in the beadwork, you'll see some of the titles of her work, but she has a, a huge body of work. And so I couldn't fit it onto this first piece, so I created a second piece where I was able to uh, use the titles of her work in a quilt and make it all work together artistically. So. I love the asymmetry uh, to it. I think that really um, mm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> adds to it. Um, so then we're looking at some other mixed media works. Um, uh, one by Dinga here on the left, a self-portrait. Uh, and then compared to uh, this work by Rauschenberg. Dinga, would you like to tell us a little bit about um, the self-portrait? Um, the self-portrait is about embracing who you are at the moment that you're there. Um, many of us who are older, we lament the loss, some of us, of our waistlines, but then in place of the waistline, you get wisdom, knowledge, and just you know, a lot of other things. So like I said, I embraced the younger woman I used to be. I loved the person that I was, but there's something really beautiful about getting older. Mm. And sometimes in America, we don't really value our senior citizens, so. Sure. Did you go into this knowing that you wanted it to have, you know, that, that physical form uh, to it in, in the diptych or were you making a, a, a mixed media quilted piece first and, and thought perhaps it was all gonna be like that? Uh, I don't really remember, but usually I'll start, I probably started with the body, which is actually uh, paper, which is another fiber. And it's paper pulp, that's molded over uh, um, an advertising body form. And then on the side of it is um, those two circular pieces. Those are excerpts from a book. Cause one of my things that I haven't shown a lot is the books that I've done. And this book too, the, the title of it was, Oh my God, I'm 65. And so I used two of those pieces. And then the pieces that are dangling those are some of the issues that come up uh, when you do hit 65. Like basically you get ignored. Um, people have this thing about gray hair. And so I discussed quite a number of issues on this bottom part here. Still revolutionary and a trailblazer and helping people accept the aging process with dignity and grace. Mm -hmm. Love that thing. Um, Korsh, could you tell us a little bit about why you chose to uh, include the Rauschenberg? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, when Rauschenberg started showing the world his combines in the 1950s, combine literally meaning combining things, uh, he was, he blew the doors wide open on what you could use to make art. Because now you could use anything. He was combining nuts and bolts and textiles and dead animals and 
you know, furniture and anything that could be put together to look like something interesting that he wanted to share a story about, he did. And if you look at Denga's work on the left, you will see that she too uses everything that comes to her that she feels is going to add to her story. And, and I find it interesting that, um, Denga, you told us at some point when there's a sale at a uh, notion store or a special fabric store or something, and then they had these beads available or something, you ran to get them quickly because you knew that somehow you're gonna put them to use. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I look at this and I see there's everything in here. It's, it, there's sculpture, there's uh, the paper, the papier mache underneath it that you form the body with. There's, you know, the, the strips of, of, uh, of textile that, that, uh, that you put in, the uh, lace and the beads and the jewelry and rhinestones and paint and you name it, it's there. Sure. Um, very much uh, like like Rauschenberg, you did say that that your work is original. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think that Rauschenberg blew the doors open on people considering using everyday items. But but you take it, you take you knock it out of the ballpark with yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so looking at, at some other uh, a comparison of mixed media work, Howard Dean and Pindell on the left, and this uh, piece um, a tribute to. Nelson uh, Mandela on the right. And Dinga, isn't this paper under under here as well? It's, yes. it's fabric and paper. Um, actually, that purple in the background, that's uh, quilt batting, which would normally be not seen and in between the top and the back of the quilt. That whole red area is actually brown paper. And on top of that, I sewed, um, these letters, they probably come from the scrapbook department made out of chipboard. I actually was able to sew them onto the paper and paint them. And when you look at it, it looks like leather, but it's paper. Okay. And the rest of this is felted pieces and beads and whatnot. Nice. Um, I love this. Um, so we also wanted to discuss Dinga as an art influencer. Um, I don't uh, know if overtly uh, Biza Butler or Micheline Thomas have uh, credited you in some way as influencing their art careers, but I think as uh, an observer of art and um, someone always, you know, always looking at works, it's quite clear to see the influence um, that uh, you might have had on them. Biza Butler is a rising star in the art world now and making these large quilts. Um, and without your career and the work that you've done to champion for yourself and other women artists, I, I don't think that um, these, you know, this next generation would be able to have the the careers and the the jump start that everyone everyone's had. Um, I think it's the you know you helped open the doors um, for you know the gen, you know, generation after you, and then this, this next youngest generation coming up. Um, so it's, uh, really exciting. Are these artists on your radar? Do you, you go and look at their, at the, the works of the, the younger generation? Uh, yes. Abisa Butler, I know personally, I have always loved her work and it's incredible. I don't know Micheline Thomas, but I love what I see and I'm going to go and do a little research and see what else she's doing. And um, yes, myself, where we at Black Women Artists, the way you see, we opened the doors, we built the path so that other artists could come and thrive, not just exist as artists, but to actually thrive. So to me, that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah. Um, wonderful. And Donovan, this goes to you talking about the heritage also, this, um, the generational influence among, among these artists. Um, do you perhaps have anything to contribute here about, uh, about this? Yeah, I mean, the intergenerational struggle, I think, is really important when you're talking about building a heritage. The, one of the negative effects of the African diaspora as the result of the transatlantic slave trade, among other things, is a destruction of history. That's why philosophers like Locke and in the French speaking world, philosophers of the anti-colonial movement who developed the theory of negritude and other philosophical concepts 
recognized that there was no going back to reclaim something, that, that something had really been lost. And so there was a need to construct something new and to be trailblazers and to forge a new path, one in which their persons, their own history and their blackness could be, you know, seen as a positive and seen as a thing to be proud of. I'm really fascinated that collaging comes up so much because collaging affects in the material the thing that people are trying to do, which is rebuild an identity for themselves and to put together from the remnants of the diaspora something new and creative and vibrant and, and alive and living. So um, the idea of constructing a canon or constructing a heritage is I think something that we can all learn from uh, by witnessing not just black art, but the, the literary history as well. Thanks. Um, so what's happening now? Uh, so now in terms of 2020, it's been a, a good year for you, Dinga, right? In the midst of everything terrible that's going on. It's, it's been, uh, it's been pretty good. So starting off the year in January, uh, one of your works of art, which had been owned by the Johnson Publishing Company, um, was auctioned off and it uh, far exceeded its high estimate. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience? Um, I actually went to the auction and um, I took with me the friend of mine who had emailed me this page so that I actually knew that there was an auction going on. And uh, once my piece came up and the price kept going up and up and up and up and up, I probably was more amazed than anybody. Um, probably if I was prone to fainting, I would have fainted, but I didn't I just I was it was like phenomenal I couldn't believe what was happening you know but it was also a very interesting experience because at that auction there were a lot of black people there because a lot of times you think at the auctions only white people go to buy work but there were a lot of black people there bidding on the different works and to me that says uh, our traveling and our pushing and our having the little exhibits for the first like from 1960 to 1980, it paid off because we uh, have grown a group of collectors, hmm. a very serious people. So, yeah, yeah so that was okay. it. And then, so following that experience, um, you have now signed with a gallery for the first time, correct? This is true. The first time ever with the Freedman Gallery down on the Bowery. Uh, here's a picture of Ilya Friedman with four of my pieces from this year. This is recent work. Oh, actually, it's five because there's a painting over here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and that over here from the announcement. Yes. Um, wonderful. Very exciting. And so you're, well, I think we'll get to that, I think, at the end, what's coming next. Um, but uh, more to come about that. Um, and then so right now you have a private sale happening at Phillips auction house as well this is true so that's been exciting very um, very very exciting yes yeah uh Korish and i had a little role in helping to make that happen which was a great pleasure of ours um to be able to contribute to that facilitating that uh and it involved also uh, a nice conversation between yourself and Lowry Sim. So if anyone watching this wants to go over to phillips.com afterwards, you can see Dinga's work that's available. And there is a webinar, um, a conversation between you and David Norman, who's the chairman of the Americas, um, who was uh, helped um, champion for your work at, at, uh, at Phillips. And then also a nice interview um, that people can read between you and Lowry, which is excellent. Um, here are two of the works also that are in that sale, which have since sold. So it's nice to see uh, the greater breadth of your work with a piece from the, the 70s in addition to the, the newer work. Um, but you can also see the, the consistency, you know, strong black women um, being depicted in everyday life. Um, do you see a, a great uh, difference between uh, these works or is there something deliberate that you're um, trying to channel from, from what you were making in the 70s to what's happening now? No, the only thing that's changed is my color's gotten even brighter. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, some artists uh, have themes that kind of go throughout their work. 
Mine is telling the stories of African-American women through my eyes. And that's a subject that is so big and has so much depth and breadth to it. I'll probably be doing that for the rest of my life. Um, I do do work dealing with people of the African diaspora, but my focus is on women because um, there's a lot of stories that have not been told and I want to tell them. Yeah, oh, another, I was not familiar with Lavinia Williams until mm -hmm. I became acquainted with your work. I think okay. there are many, um, you know, many people's lives that um, you have the ability to, you know, turn people on to, you know, the, these women's stories, women in general stories haven't been told to the extent that they should. And I think that you're a great champion for many African-American women to show the significance of what people were doing with their lives, despite the, the difficulties that they faced. Most definitely. Yeah. Um, and so what's next? Um, tomorrow, there's another auction. Um, the African-American auction at Swan takes place tomorrow, starting at noon. And these three works of yours are, are going up to auction then. So again, if you're watching, you should contact Swan and register to, to bid on these works. It's nice to see um, uh, the differences here in, in what you're creating. Um, from these the paintings to, I guess, um, do you know the, the pink piece? Is that a um, linoleum cut? Mm -hmm. Linoleum cut. Linoleum um, cut, yeah. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got a cookbook now, which is really exciting. How did that come about? Um, because uh, when I have time, I have friends over, and food is, takes the center. And for years and years, people said, um, oh, you know, you're doing all of this food. And Leon is actually the chef. I just make things out. Um, and they kept saying, well, why don't you do a cookbook? Why don't you do a cookbook? So one year I sat down, I said, okay, I'm going to do this cookbook. And then, you know, hopefully y'all will be happy. And it took about two years, but I finally came out with it. And Bomb Magazine will be... Uh, have an excerpt of it in their next issue, which is out next week. And it's available at the Friedman Gallery if you actually want a physical copy. Nice. Um, I, well, and I have physical copies of it already. Okay. Um, we have also tasted um, some of your uh, cooking, so it's uh, highly recommended. Um, and uh, some of your breads. Uh, so I think that it's uh, well worth uh, exploring some of the recipes in this book. Um, and then uh, going towards what's next, uh, this is a picture of the Brooklyn Museum. There um, is another uh, uh, piece that's being acquired by the Brooklyn Museum. And I, I think that uh, what can be expected over the next few years are other uh, institutional placements of your work, uh, museum acquisitions. And um, I would suspect and hope um, that a museum retrospective is going to be on its way. I'm sure that um, everyone uh, on your team uh, will be, um, you know, working hard uh, to support those endeavors and find the right place to, you know, put together um, a larger, you know, body of your work over the course of your career um, because people need to see your work and to be in front of it and to learn from it and to learn about the stories of the, um, you know, the people that you have uh, been inspired by to create art. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems like uh, there is a lot, uh, a lot ahead, Dinga. This is true. Yeah. This and so you, you're in a new studio space now and. Oh, I love it. I fought for 40 years to not have a studio outside of my home. Once I got it, now you can't get me out of there. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, so uh, you can visit philosophyarts.com to look at um, some work. If you have any questions about collecting some of the works that were available um, in the PowerPoint presentation, we can put you in touch with Koresh um, and be happy to do so. Uh, and then, so the way that we close out uh, this series is with a philosophical question um, because uh, we know that we can't cover an artist's entire career in a half an hour. Of course, we never keep ourselves to half an hour. We're trying to get better with that over time. Um, 
but uh, these discussions leave us with more questions than answers, I hope, sometimes. So Donovan, this is, uh, this is Donovan's uh, segment again also. Do um, you want to tell us a little bit about this question? Yeah, I think that one of the things that Dinga's work really invites us to meditate on and take with us as we reflect on the art that we see is how artists work to create new identities for marginalized people and how art shapes our sense of identity and offers us a sense of community through which that identity can be expressed. So I think this question is something that people will hopefully continue to think about um, as they continue to work look at Dinga's work. Yeah. So how do artists explicitly work to create new identities for marginalized people? Donovan, thank you for that. And Dinga, thank you so much for spending the time with us this evening to share about your works and your life and, um, you know, shed light thank on some of these exciting stories. Thank you for sharing your work throughout this process. Mm -hmm. Course. Thanks for being with us. And again, thank you to Dinga McCannon. It's been a great pleasure for us to spotlight you tonight on Disclosures Through Dialogue. Um, okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be back in 2021 with our next installment. Um, please join us then. Okay. Cheers. Bye, everyone. <laughs>